Welcome everyone to the virtual county conservation meeting. This is our last session. Um, so it's um, going to kind of just end abruptly and we'll be done. Um, but we certainly appreciate everyone's attendance at the county conservation meeting. And this session, and hopefully you're in the right spot and you want to be here, is the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, Cutting Edge Climate Data in Your Own Backyard. And this is Penny Poli and I work at Wisconsin Land and Water. And um, Dan is not gonna give you this little update about how to use Zoom, but I think everyone pretty much knows. We want everyone to stay muted and to keep your webcams off, except for the presenters. And you can send questions in through the chat line at any time. The way that we're gonna do this session is Dan's gonna give his presentation first, and we'll take questions regarding his presentation and then Sarah will start her presentation and we'll take questions afterwards with her presentation and then also any general questions for both of them obviously so yeah just send those send those into your chat line at any time and we will take them later and I just want to tell you a little bit about our presenters that we're really happy to have with us for this session um, they are the co-directors of the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts we have Sarah Walling from Wisconsin DACAP and Dan Vimont from or Vimont from the Wisconsin University of Wisconsin Madison and let me tell you a little bit about them Dan Vimont is a professor of atmospheric and oceanic service sciences at the University of Wisconsin Madison and he directs the Nelson Institute Center for climatic research and he also helps direct the Wisconsin initiative on climate change impacts which aims to work with individuals and agencies around the state to advance climate change solutions in Wisconsin and Sarah is the administrator for the Agriculture Resource Management Division within Wisconsin DACAP, which stands for Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection. And Sarah's division is responsible for the oversight of pesticide, fertilizer, animal feed, plant industry regulation, and environmental soil and water conservation programs. And prior to this role, Sarah directed the University of Wisconsin Madison's Division of Extensions Institute of Agriculture and served the state for 12 years in several positions in DACAP, all of which involved working with agriculture producers, landowners, and partner agencies on agricultural environmental management issues. Okay, so again, please send in your questions to the chat line and we will get to those at the end of Dan's presentation. And I think, Dan, you want to take it away? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can't see the questions on, as I'm presenting here, but feel free, anybody, uh, to fire away with questions. Uh, the downside, well, among the, the downsides of presenting uh, remotely here is I, I, like, uh, I like taking questions on the fly uh, in general, and I uh, love it when people ask questions. So if you have any questions about climate change, uh, just type them into the chat bar, and if we don't get to them uh, due to time or something like that, I'll uh, I'll type in some uh, answers um, uh, after the after the talk as well. Um, um, I always say uh, I, I give this presentation a lot around the state, and um, I am happy to answer any questions you have at all. Anything you've heard about climate change, if you have things that are confusing to you, um, let me know. I've uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I'm going to focus today on uh, climate change in Wisconsin, some of the, the things we've observed, and uh, some of the directions we're heading uh, with uh, in terms of the physical climate system here. Let's see here. I usually start these presentations out with a description of global climate and what's been happening on a global scale. Uh, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna shorten that up a little bit and just show this one curve. This is the global temperature from NOAA, uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, global uh, land and ocean temperature, and what it shows is uh, how warm each year was from 1880 to 2020 here, uh, compared to the 20th century average. So every one of the red bars is warmer than the 20th century average. Every one of the blue bars was colder than the 20th century average. So you can see that there was a warming trend through the 20th century. And so in the beginning of the 20th century here, generally we're colder than the average, and towards the end of the century, it's been warmer than average. 
Uh, in fact, I have only been alive for two years that were colder than the uh, 20th century average. And you can figure out my age based on that. <laughs> you need to be careful about uh, advertising that too much. Um, it's, there's, a, there's a huge warming trend at the end of this. Uh, so global temperatures have been warming. We've warmed by about a uh, degree Celsius over the last 50 years or so, about uh, a little more than that uh, over the last, say, 120 years. Uh, I want to point out a couple of years here. Just the just, while there is this long upward trend here towards the end, this warming trend that we're seeing here, there's a couple of years that stand out. And one of them is 1998 right here. And one of them is 2016. Both of those years were abnormally warm, even compared to the long-term trend. That's because those were large El Nino events. Those are events in the tropical Pacific where the entire tropical Pacific warms up and so forth. It's not very important. The point here is 1998 was the warmest year in the 20th century uh, it, it, by, by a long shot. And 2016, another very large El Nino event, was the warmest year we've experienced yet. If you look at this trend here, uh, we will never again experience a year that is colder than 1998. That's colder than the warmest year in the 20th century. That's something that's a, that's a reality that we need to kind of internalize as a, as a uh, society here, that there really is no going back on a lot of this. We need to figure out how to stabilize this curve and uh, hopefully at some point, um, uh, uh, either um, through geoengineering or something, uh, reduce carbon dioxide to uh, try and bring it down. Okay. Let's see here. So a couple of just in, on the global scale, uh, things we know about climate change, humans are causing the world to warm. And I'd be happy to give evidence for this if you if you would like any uh, uh, information. Type in the chat bar if you have any questions on it, uh, any evidence for any of this. Uh, human caused warming and the CO2 increase will continue. We will never see conditions uh, in the 20th century uh, on a global scale uh, again. And that's kind of a dismal sounding uh, message there, but uh, I, wanna, I wanna emphasize that action is needed and is possible. Not only is it possible uh, in a lot of ways, especially regionally, uh, it's economically beneficial. We can, we can uh, um, be taking action to reduce the amount of climate change that we experience, uh, and we can grow uh, various parts of the economy at the same time. All right, in Wisconsin, let's see what's happening. I, I wanna move immediately to local climate change and what's happening in Wisconsin. It's kind of hard for me to interpret what that long-term graph means on a local scale. And uh, this is where uh, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts comes into play. Wiki uh, began in uh, about 2007, 2008, with a mission to generate and share information that can limit vulnerability to climate change in Wisconsin and the Midwest. And so Wiki kind of sits in this realm between science and solutions. We try and connect people uh, who are trying to come up with climate change solutions, and uh, we try and identify what science is needed in order to enable those kinds of solutions to move forward. Uh, and um, we're currently in the process of uh, updating our 2011 assessment report. We have a new website, uh, www.wiki.wisc.edu. I encourage you to take a look there for additional information. So how has Wisconsin's climate been changing? This is the uh, amount that, uh, what I'm gonna show here on the, on the uh, observed maps are how much Wisconsin has warmed since 1950. And this is based on people going outside, taking measurements every single day. Um, the uh, National Centers tabulate that information and we end up with these records of, of uh, temperature uh, over, the, over the entire US. And Wisconsin's warm by two to three degrees Fahrenheit uh, since 1950. Uh, I'm gonna be using Fahrenheit for most of this because for the life of me, I can't uh, do the conversion in my head to, to Celsius here. Um, Wisconsin will continue to warm by another two to eight degrees Fahrenheit by 2050. These are things that uh, we're very confident of. Uh, when we look at the warming that's happened in the past, we notice something interesting, and that is that 
the colder temperatures, like winter and nighttime low temperatures, have been warming faster than the daytime highs and the summer temperatures. So Chris Kucherik likes to say that Wisconsin is getting less cold. Uh, and that's, that's one way of, of thinking about this. What's interesting is that observed variability is also seen in climate models that are run uh, to investigate what uh, the future climate will look like. Uh, climate models forced by greenhouse gases and by uh, anthropogenic uh, carbon dioxide and so forth also suggest that colder temperatures should be warming faster than the, the warmer times of year. So winter warms more than summer. Winter's warm by about 3 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit by 2050. And there's a lot of implications for that. One is uh, less snow and less ice. Uh, and uh, implications of that uh, to tourism in the wintertime uh, are important. This is a cranberry bog. I'm not a uh, cranberry farmer. I don't pretend to be able to uh, tell you a lot about uh, how this, uh, how cranberry farming is, uh, is done, but it's my understanding that the ice uh, provides a buffer um, or a, an insulating layer for uh, cranberries. And also, I think um, sand is also spread on top of the ice so that it can uh, uh, infiltrate down into the soil so during the winter time. So there's potential impacts there. Other potential impacts of uh, reduced snow and ice is more rain on snow events uh, and more um, uh, kind of variability uh, over semi-frozen and frozen ground during the winter and the springtime. And so that's something that is an agricultural impact. The summertime, uh, if winter warms more than the average, then summer is warming less than the average. So. Uh, we've seen warming of about one to two degrees Fahrenheit in summer uh, over the last, uh, say, 70 years or so. And the models that are forced by these, these physical climate models also show the same thing, that summer should warm less uh, than uh, winter. Despite that reduced warming, there still are important impacts of that warming. Uh, one is the, uh, the change in, say, in extreme events. And so this shows on the left here. Um, how many days get above 90 degrees in the summertime, in a typical summer. And here in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, we get about 10 or 11 days per year where the temperature gets above 90 degrees. So the last few, day, last few days have been an example of that. By mid-century, we expect that to triple. We expect uh, 30 days per summer. Uh, to be above 90 degrees. And that's even more uh, pronounced for um, uh, southern Wisconsin. Uh, in general, there's about a tripling of these extreme heat days. And implications of that uh, for uh, growing, uh, for um, uh, corn yield, uh, and so forth, um, th that tends to reduce uh, effectiveness of, um, or, re or reduce uh, yields and so forth. The other important impact of this, of course, is human health, um, uh, especially um, in urban areas where, that are not particularly well set up uh, for dealing with heat. Extreme heat has killed more people in Wisconsin than every other natural disaster combined. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a very important impact and it's something that um, the Department of Health Services is working uh, to understand impacts of extreme heat. Wisconsin is getting wetter, and this is something we've observed a lot over the last decade or so. In general, southern Wisconsin has gotten uh, over 20% wetter uh, from since 1950, uh, so 20% more rain uh, since 1950. Um, and that's, uh, that trend is larger than one would expect from just the temperature effect of climate change. So there's something else interesting going on here that we don't fully understand at this point. That's consistent with projections. Uh, future projections of precipitation uh, show that winter and spring will be wetter, um, and future projections in summertime are uncertain. Some models say it'll be wetter, some models say uh, there'll be less, uh, there, there, there will be less rain. Um, and likely any, any given year there'll be more or less rain. Rain is really, really noisy in the summertime. Um, but in the winter and spring we do expect more rain. Combine that with warmer uh, winters and warmer springs, and we end up with more rain rather than snow. We end up with more rain on frozen ground, 
and more extreme rainfall in, say, uh, springtime uh, when runoff is a really big issue. These are things that we need to start uh, uh, planning for. Despite the fact that summer precipitation in general is somewhat uncertain whether it will be wetter or less uh, or drier, um, there are a few things we can say uh, about uh, precipitation, the characteristics of precipitation. And one is that really big precipitation events will likely become more common. Uh, in, South, in, in Wisconsin, um, we uh, typically get uh, um, uh, every 100 years or so, we have about 10 or so days here in southern Wisconsin uh, with more than four inches of rain on a given day. And that's likely to jump to 14 to 16. So an increase, uh, so that, become, that, start, that moves from say a, uh, a um, say 10 or 15 year event to more of like a five or six year event. Uh, one thing we've seen is that 100-year uh, rainfall events are likely to become a lot more common, like 50-year rainfall events or even 30-year rainfall events in some areas of the state. Uh, over the last 10 years, uh, we've, we've experienced at least 16 100-year rainfall events over the last 10 years in various uh, places in Wisconsin. Uh, and so these really extreme rainfall events are likely to become uh, more common. There are obvious impacts of that to flooding and uh, uh, flooded fields, uh, runoff, uh, more moisture or more humidity can lead to changes in, in um, or can lead to impacts uh, for uh, crops as well. And then certainly uh, flooding uh, reduces yield and uh, if flooding um, affects the ability to get around a farm or to get around a, a part of our, our state, then there's increased cost for uh, transportation. So I'm gonna, just a summary, uh, I encourage you to check out the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. Uh, we have a lot more than, I've, I've just shown a couple of impacts that I think are, are relevant for Wisconsin. Uh, we've looked at a lot more um, physical climate uh, changes and uh, Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts is thinking about how this impacts us from communities to infrastructure to uh, agricultural communities, uh, urban communities, uh, what it means and what we can, what we should be thinking about in terms of adapting to these changes. Uh, we expect warmer, wetter winters, less snow and ice, more rain on frozen ground. We expect especially a warmer spring and fall and more extreme heat and more uh, extreme uh, precipitation. Um, and then, the, the message I kind of want to end with, I suppose, is that, uh, you know, I kind of give a dire, <laughs> dire uh, sounding, um, you know, at the beginning of this when I said we'll never experience conditions that uh, on a global scale that we experienced in the 20th century again. Uh, action is needed now uh, and we can act. And there are things we can do to minimize the impacts of climate change and we need to be doing those immediately. Um, in Wisconsin, we need to be doing two things. One, we need to be reducing the amount of, uh, of carbon that we're emitting. We need to be reducing the amount of uh, climate change that's occurring. But also, we can and we are already preparing for the amount of climate change that is kind of inevitable that we are going to be experiencing uh, regardless of whether those mitigation, those, those uh, activities to reduce the amount of climate change um, uh, occur on a global scale. Uh, and so, all of us can be taking action to reduce this. All of us are impacted in our own ways and all of us can be uh, acting to minimize the impacts to, um, to our communities. I encourage you to check out wiki.wisc.edu. We have a new website uh, that should be um, evolving quite a bit over the next year as we add more and more reports from our uh, working groups. Uh, and uh, I have a series of uh, additional um, uh, resources that I think are really useful, especially Project Drawdown. If you haven't looked at Project Drawdown, it's a really positive uh, uh, website that talks about different things that we can be doing as a sort of global society to reduce the amount of climate change. And it's really surprising. Some of the top things that we can be doing to reduce climate change are things you might not expect, like changing eating habits. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, educating uh, girls uh, in developing countries. 
uh, I think that's number six in terms of effectiveness uh, for global um, uh, uh, for reducing climate change. Uh, so check out Project Drawdown, and of course, once again, check out wiki.wist.edu. Be happy to take any questions if there are any in the chat bar, um, and I can um, uh, answer any other questions if people have them. Just fire them in the chat bar as we go along. Okay, so far we don't have any questions. Um, how about if we get Sarah's presentation loaded and we can give that'll give some people some time. Sounds good. Okay, let me see about sharing my screen here. Okay, do you see my lead slide? Great. Yep. Okay, Penny, any other questions or should I just, should I launch in and we'll take everything at the end? You're muted if you're trying to tell me something. Why don't we do them at the end? Yes, okay. please get started, Sarah. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you guys for having me today. I think my, um, my talk is gonna kind of jump from Dan's on the science behind uh, climate change and whatnot. That's a great lead in because everybody on this call is facing climate change impacts in a number of different ways personally um, with you know your own lives but certainly with um, you know the network of, of your professional careers I guess working with agriculture and forestry and our land and water resources and um, certainly are experiencing the what those impacts look like on a day-to-day -day basis seasonally especially um, in the 15 years or so that I've been working in agriculture in this state I've certainly noticed it in growing degree days increasing in these extreme weather events and the havoc that that creates not just in our agricultural settings, certainly, but um, across the board, um, as Dan mentioned, and you know, public health issues, um, certainly our construction and industry um, sectors as well, and making sure that we're doing the best that we can to be um, mitigating our, our impact or our, our um, contributions to climate change, but I think equally, if not more important at this point, given what Dan um, you know, led with, is that we, oh, there's really no going back at this point, is how do we move into a phase both um, in policy development at the state level, but also in our day-to-day -day activities and best management practices, land use policy, those kinds of arenas, to do what we can to ensure that, um, especially in you know, my focus today will be on agriculture, but that our agricultural industry remains um, intact and flexible and adaptable and resilient as these climate change impacts um, occur. So today I'm gonna to give you guys a bit of an overview and this might um, overlap a bit um, with a couple of the presentations from yesterday that I was able to watch the county conservationists um, present some of the activities they're doing. So I'll try to tie back to some of that as well. And then if, um, Lieutenant, if our Lieutenant Governor was able to speak initially, I missed the keynote yesterday, but. Um, we're certainly working very closely with our governor's office on a lot of these initiatives and I'll walk through some of the stuff that we're actively engaged in at the state level to move toward a more climate change conscious uh, sector and uh, state government policy development realm. So this picture is just intended to kind of give you a context of all the things that are sort of happening. This certainly is not an exhaustive list. There's tons of stuff going on in the private sector and in on NGO worlds, et cetera. And I, I kind of toss all those into the partner areas and whatnot, and we're connecting as best we can, and that will continue to evolve and grow over the next several years, but in a couple, in all these ways. So um, one of the great fun things I get to do in my job is I help serve with, the, with Wiki um, as a co-chair of the Agricultural Working Group. Um, it's a role that I participated in, in um, fits and starts about 15 years ago when Wiki was first launched as well. So it's really interesting and uh, rewarding to see these conversations coming back around um, because obviously, as Dan pointed out, the issues aren't going away. And so we definitely want to be able to um, continue to act and react to what's going on and uh, build our resiliency as best we can. So the other things I want to talk about since he covered Wiki and the science, so that's really that science realm informing us, helping us bring that um, educational materials to bear so that we can educate ourselves and those we work with and interact with about climate science and climate change. And so I'm gonna move instead to a couple of the ways that our department and as well as many other agencies and uh, sectors of local, state and federal government are working together to um, move more, move forward in, our, in a climate discussion and climate change policy development and, and program uh, 
area development as well. So that's the US Climate Alliance, which I'll start with, and then move into the Wisconsin Climate Change Task Force work. So the US Climate Alliance has been around for a while. Um, our state did just join last year. Governor Evers signed us on. It's a group of governors that work together and, um, you know, and, and uh, pledge to work toward the goals of the Paris Agreement, which in this case is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28% below our 2005 levels by 2025. Um, so it's definitely focusing on what we can do to slow the uh, impacts of climate change, slow that climate change altogether. Recognizing that again, although we can't go back, there are certain things we can do to kind of stymie its progression. Um, you can see the website on there. And so this is one of the new um, advances that we've made at the state level in participating in this uh, US um, uh, focused alliance. And um, interestingly and, and positively, it's a very bipartisan uh, group of states that are committed to these goals and to these principles and are working actively to engage at the state level and across states and regions to learn from each other, to try to grab on to what policies are working well, what kind of you know, uh, reductions are you able to achieve and learn from one another rather than everybody reinventing the wheel on a state by state level. One of the, one of the uh, more focused areas that really hones in on forestry and agriculture in particular are the natural working lands challenge uh, component of the US Climate Alliance. This is also something that Wisconsin has engaged in. Uh, ourselves at DACAP and DNR have been extremely engaged in this as well as the Lieutenant Governor's Office. At the, so at the governor's level, there's um, a great deal of involvement here too. And the goals are kind of laid out here, but it's certainly looking at all the things that a lot of us, you know, you heard about yesterday in uh, the talks from the counties about what they're doing to, to, you know, work on some of these things. But the cool thing, and I think you'll hear this from me throughout my talk, is that all the things we're talking about here are all the things that we're already really trying to promote for a number of other reasons, not just for climate change, resiliency, and sustainability through the, you know, the change in climate that we're experiencing. But building that uh, longer term carbon storage in our soils. We want, we want to do that already for you know, in, ensuring that we're reducing soil erosion rates and that we're building healthier soils. So cover crops, um, you know, new, using no-till and those kind of things are already things that we're working very proactively in a number of program areas and um, incentive programs as well as regulatory forums to try to um, move forward. But the goals of the Natural Working Lands Challenge are really to make sure that us as states at the policy making levels are aware of and appreciating all the tools that exist uh, across the country for estimating things like how much carbon is being stored by various practices so that we can put some of those uh, actions to, um, to bear in carbon markets so that our farmers and foresters and landowners um, who are operating these lands have another way to sort of capitalize on the good work that they're doing and be financially um, reimbursed for the cost associated with that. So those are um, those have been really great. There's been a, there's no meetings uh, continuously that are informing us about what other states are doing, what tools are being developed in those areas. And so again, it's a it's been a really good way for us as a state who's sort of really re um, launching goals in this area to get in touch with folks that have been doing this for quite a while, as well as others that are just like us that are kind of revisiting and, and really re-upping re the game when it comes to policy development associated with uh, climate change impacts and resiliency. And then as I'm sure you heard a little bit um, yesterday um, from the Lieutenant Governor is that we are a part of the Climate Change Task Force, certainly. Um, all the state agencies um, have a role to play in, in these discussions and so we're all uh, very much at the table. And we've been serving through DATCAP and DNR as well um, on the land use and conservation subcommittee of the climate change task force. Um, as you know, the task force itself is a, a very diverse coalition of representatives across all the industry sectors. Um, many of our populations, including our native nations, but also um, you know, rural, urban um, NGOs. There's, it's, it's, a, it's really quite impressive, uh, the group that the Lieutenant Governor has brought together for each of these subcommittees. And I'll speak most closely to the land use and conservation group, because that's what I'm personally engaged in. Uh, Randy Romanski, our secretary designee, is actually the appointee, but as you can imagine, um, he can't make the lift on his own. So I've been stepping in to support this where I can um, over the last several months and will continue to do so as we move toward our report to the Lieutenant Governor for this fall. 
Certainly the goal is um, here is to, is to reduce our carbon uh, impacts. So we'll move to a 100% carbon free um, energy sources in the state um, very, very soon and very quickly. So it's an ambitious uh, goal, but I think it's certainly something that um, is, a, is good for us to put our focus, our attention on and work um, intensively toward that goal. And, you know, if you don't set aggressive, uh, ag aggressive goals and aggressive action doesn't usually follow with it. So I, um, I've been really pleased with the energy and whatnot around that recommendation and, um, and goal where we're headed. This is a little bit of a um, description of what our land use and conservation subcommittee is all about. So we're certainly trying to reduce um, agriculture and forestry's uh, carbon footprints, both through mitigation and adaptation. Um, we're looking to really use bold science-based approaches to these issues. Um, committing ourselves, as was mentioned in, in, Dan, in Dan's talk a bit, that um, various communities in, in our, in our uh, state are unequally affected by climate change impacts. And so keeping those um, concepts in mind uh, very closely as we develop any recommendations that we provide to the state at the state level um, is certainly looking toward that. We're also, of course, very conscious of um, employment issues and underemployment. And you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities as we move toward a cleaner energy um, infrastructure, et cetera, to um, really grow the, the jobs, uh, job opportunities that exist around these topics. And we saw that uh, you know, 15, 10, to, 10 to 12 years ago as um, we were really moving into that bioenergy realm for a while. And then you know, um, a number of factors, including natural gas prices, really played into kind of um, back burner, pardon the pun, that, um, those initiatives and, and the progress that we were making there. But uh, what we were able to show is that there's a lot of opportunity to grow uh, jobs in a number of uh, various sectors and look to a, a longer term solution um, to the issue of underemployment um, through these uh, new uh, industry sectors. So really more focusing though on climate change goals for um, us in agriculture is, again, I, you know, I, I hail back to the concept I mentioned earlier, which is, a lot of these things we are already really promoting and really actively pursuing for other reasons. And I think that's the great um, opportunity for agriculture in particular in this is that it's just another reason for us to really up the ante when it comes to educating ourselves about what climate change is gonna be looking like for agriculture and the challenges that it's gonna create for us. Um, and then being able to adapt with those. And a lot of the tools that we have to do that are really um, often already at our fingertips. We're already also seeing a number of people, you know, we're, of farmers out there and landowners working to um, mitigate, uh, you know, the issues that they're seeing with soil erosion or they're involved in the producer-led watershed protection grant program and are trying to improve the water quality within the watersheds that they reside in and their groundwater quality. And again, a lot of those same um, practices are the things that we are going to be looking to identify policies to further um, uh, promote and incentivize these activities so that you the farms are also able to kind of you know garner another level of income associated with the work that they're already doing. The thing I also like about uh, some of the things I like about this too is that in the case of farms that have been long-term participants in things like um, uh, you know, the conservation reserve program or have been doing long-term no-till and whatnot, a lot of the programs that we have in place today don't, in, they incentivize folks to change behavior. So, but if you've already been doing those activities, you don't necessarily qualify for cost share dollars or other financial incentives. Um, you know, certainly we appreciate the, the long-term work that those farms have engaged in to, to, um, reduce their overall environmental and carbon footprint. Um, but this is, this is a, an ability that we have to look at other ways that we can incentivize those behaviors um, that have been happening for a long time. So making, you know, making sure that the, the good actors out there are, are, are able to similarly benefit from the financial incentives that might come with some of these um, climate related efforts instead. So again, a lot of the solutions that we're looking at are, are and developing policy and program areas around this will be, how do we increase the perennials that are out there, um, both in rotations, but perennializing landscapes that are maybe not as well suited to agricultural forestry settings and, and putting things in, um, in place that would provide that longer term soil carbon storage, but also longer term 
cover uh, for those areas. Um, similarly, co-benefits exist, of course, with um, increasing habitat and those types of things as well. So there's a lot of, um, of layered cake approach to the benefits that are coming with a lot of activities that I'm listing on, on this page. And again, we know how to do a lot of these things. And so we're able to, as um, I heard, uh, was discussed yesterday in um, the Okana County pre presentation is a lot of times we don't even talk about it in the concept of climate change, that these are, you know, there's other reasons that landowners and operators have to want to pursue some of these practices. But I think it is important to continue to try to integrate the climate discussion into that um, because I think you know regardless of whether uh, individuals necessarily are entirely on board 100% with the concept of climate change pretty much everybody across the state has been able to witness the fact that we don't have as much snow in the winters or we have um, a lot more of these intense rainfall events which are which are really devastating and a lot of those pictures that um, they were able to show yesterday in the presentations are obviously very real demonstrations of the impacts of these uh, more intense rainfall events and drought conditions for that matter and whatnot as well. So the really, you know, the big challenge and the big lift that we have in front of us is trying to identify the policy options that exist to help us get there. Um, like I said, we already have a lot of programs in place that are trying to do a lot, of, you know, in, in incentivize these activities on the ground. Um, what can we be doing at a policy level to really move the needle even farther? Um, you know, considering that land use change is a big driver for uh, climate, climate impacts and whatnot, what can we be doing there to try to identify ways to incentivize keeping natural and working lands in their current condition instead of moving into development or, um, you know, taking, uh, taking um, perennial landscapes out of that perennialized um, rotation and we're putting it into a crop rotation, et cetera. So how do we use the policies that we have in place or how do we amend them or create new ones to incentivize um, keeping our working lands working? A lot of the things that's ha that are happening uh, at the national level are, we're, is, are things we're cued into and these are things that has, has been great for the U.S. Climate Alliance partnership that we've generated and the governor's um, adherence to that and commitment to that is that it does tie into these conversations a lot more closely. So we're learning a lot more about what climate work that's exist out there. The private sector is doing amazing things and really taking um, large, uh, making large gains and moving their companies. So referring from, from um, McDonald's and Kellogg's, you know, to our chemical companies and whatnot are really looking toward how they can incentivize climate change impact reductions uh, through carbon market um, entry. And so they're buying carbon credits and we're looking at how we can pull Wisconsin into those, um, into those opportunities and understand them and bring them to bear for our state's landowners. Um, there is a couple interesting pieces of federal legislation or an interesting piece of federal legislation in particular that um, was uh, had a hearing in both houses actually recently. And so it's great to see it's a very bipartisan uh, act, this Growing Climate Solutions Act. Um, but, and a lot of the things that it will do is it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't create a new carbon credit marketplace, but it does create a program to assist entry um, by our, our country's landowners to get into those carbon markets. So it's trying to assess the reliability of information about those markets and making sure that people understand what they're getting into, as well as accessing, um, increasing the access of landowners to the technical service providers that they need to understand what the practices are that they need to engage in to be able to access the markets, what kind of credits they would get for that, um, the long term, you know, a lot of the, the, DS, the devil in the details kind of concepts that are associated with that. So um, we're really excited to see that moving forward in such a nice bipartisan way. And so keep your, um, you know, eyes on that one. And then also there was recently a release, it's a very, very long uh, uh, um, action plan that was released by the House um, at the federal level. But there is um, just these one these pages that I uh, indicated on my slide here are the ones that really focus on agriculture and climate solutions um, in in the, the concept of markets, policies, practices, etc. So to learn more about some of the things that we can be initiating, um, is, this has been a very helpful tool as well. And 
we've you know really only been engaging in this for about a year now um, and even that has been in fits and starts in part because of the pandemic certainly has slowed um, a number of um, opportunities down and, and things like that but I'm really excited to be working so closely with DHS and DNR on a number of these issues um, and our, our secretary's offices are also extremely engaged and interested in doing everything that we can to move our state forward in this way. So um, look forward to the next couple of years having some, uh, hopefully make, making some really tangible progress uh, toward policy development and in additional incentives to, um, to move the ball for our state. And I think with that, I will go ahead and stop here and we can take any questions. Okay, well, thanks, Sarah um, and Dan. Um, I know there was one question from Zach that um, Dan had responded to. I don't know, Dan, do you want to talk about that any more um, verbally versus your long answer in the chat box while we yes. wait for some other ones to come in? <laughs> sure. Um, uh, uh, good. Thanks for your question, Laughlin. Um, I hope I'm, uh, I presume that's, that's your name. Uh, Joys of Zoom. We only know our harmonic, our you know one <laughs> short little names there. Um, uh, there's a lot. There is a lot of natural variability in the climate system, and uh, one of the things we're you know, my my background is actually in looking at climate variability. So I very much appreciate this question. Uh, um, I got into uh, trying to understand climate change and impacts of climate change afterwards uh, later later on in my career. So. Um, the biggest thing that can happen to our climate system, on a t other than the annual cycle, so the you know the Earth going around the sun at a tilt and whatnot, is are these El Nino events, and that's why I pointed those out. That uh, they're complete rearrangement of the entire heat content of the tropical Pacific, the biggest ocean basin on Earth, covers half of our planet. Uh, it's just the, these enormous uh, changes in um, in uh, uh, just the heat distribution on our planet. And those natural events cause the planet to warm by a couple tenths of a degree Celsius. And so we just don't see uh, um, the kinds of, the, that long-term change that we're seeing, that long-term increase we're seeing that's that's now uh, you know, almost 1.2 or 1.3 degrees Celsius uh, over the last 120 years, but is, over, but is about a degree Celsius over the last 50 years. There's just nothing on the planet other than uh, climate change, nothing natural uh, that can produce those kinds of changes. Um, you know, we've certainly seen changes that large uh, since the last ice age. Um, and the kind of global warming that we're likely to experience in the next couple hundred years is comparable to the amount of warming that we've seen since the ice age. Uh, the difference being that, you know, it took us 22,000 years uh, to go from glacial maximum to now, and we're going to see all that happening, uh, you, know, you know, continue warming in the next, say, 100 years or so. So there's a lot of natural variability. The pace at which it's changing and the amplitude at which it's changing, though, is, is just, uh, just enormous. Thanks, Dan. I'd be curious, also, in terms of questions, I'd be curious to hear from anyone uh, anyone here about what are you doing? What are you concerned about? You know, what are specific impacts? Uh, one thing that Wiki uh, tries to do is learn from the people that we're, we're interacting with. And uh, if there are specific impacts that you're feeling, if there's things that your communities are asking you, uh, these are things we want to know about because that helps inform the kind of research we do as well. Okay. Um, looking for some more questions to come in. We have a couple of minutes left here in this session. Um, and I, obviously they can contact Dan or Sarah directly if they feel more comfortable with that later. Sometimes some people don't want to put <laughs> their questions out to everyone through the chat line, including myself sometimes. Um, so please um, feel free to contact them. Um, I would also add, I guess, Penny, thanks. we have a second. Sure. There's a number of ways that you guys can follow along and engage with both the um, Climate Change Task Force and with Wiki. 
So they're, um, you know, they're, the Wiki website is a great place to kind of get familiar with what it's doing, as well as the work groups, um, one of which, like I said, being agriculture. There's, I don't know how many there are, Dan, like 10 or 12 or something, you know. So there's a lot of different ways that they're, um, that Wiki is trying to, you know, kind of silo in specific areas in an attempt to maybe bring that to a bigger whole. Um, and then similarly with the Climate Change Task Force, there have been some public hearings and whatnot, but all of the work group, um, the subcommittees meetings are public. Um, and because we're in a virtual environment, it's very easy to join in and listen along. And um, now that the public, I think we might have one more public hearing left for the task force, but they've been ongoing this last three, four weeks. And um, now we actually kind of get into the meat of that work, which will be to discuss as a team and gain input from outside groups, individuals, et cetera, what policies we should really be promoting and how to put some you know, more meat to, to some of those things. Um, so I wanna make sure that you, um, anyone who's interested is able to kind of come in there. If anyone has any questions or interest in getting more engaged with that or with our Wiki Ag group, please uh, reach out to me. I'd be happy to hear from you. And um, I see there's also a number of our staff from DATCAP that are on the participant list here. So I'm really pleased to see you guys all engaged in this because as we've been um, you know, stepping into this realm over the last couple months, I need your help. <laughs> and so I think you know, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to see um, so many creative minds on that list from within our own team at DATCAP to help us kind of promote what we can be doing either with existing programs or you know tweaks around the edges or big bold ideas moving forward that we can uh, that we can take on great and dan did send out into the chat box the schedule for the task force so that is on there um yeah, there's one more public meeting uh on uh, july 15th at 6 p.m uh there's a public listening session um and those are all uh those are all you know this kind of format Great, great. Like Sarah said, they're easier for us to attend. I think that's also with this um, virtual county conservationist meeting. Sometimes people weren't able to travel or take that much time out of their schedules. So some of, we have to look at the bright spots of having these um, other resources and Zoom and go to meeting things as that. We do have another question. So let's go read that quick. I've heard from the private sector actors that one impediment to creating a comprehensive carbon market in Wisconsin is the lack of data quantifying the carbon sequestration impacts of rotational grazing. Is UW currently researching the carbon impact of rotational grazing either through Wiki or Grassland 2.0? I'm going to assume that uh, you're Silence, Sarah, is hoping that I'm going to answer that one. Uh, first of all, hi, Kara. Uh, good to <laughs> remotely uh, see you. Um, I have no idea. Um, that's, a, that's a great question, and probably Sarah is. Um, keep in mind that uh, I'm a fluid dynamicist who kind of thinks about how two fluids on a rotating sphere interact with each other. Um, so I don't even know what rotational grazing is, but I can guess what it is. So Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. Totally so, fun. so yes, um, is the best answer for that. I think it, you know, to be honest, it's yes, it's being something to look at. I know there's components of that certainly in um, in Grasslands 2.0 as well, which is a it worth its own uh, hour long presentation on its own, if you ask me. But um, but certainly yes. But I would also say that a lot of that information and data doesn't necessarily need to be re researched, right? I mean, we know a lot of the carbon. Uh, mitigation uh, benefits of moving to a rotationally based system for a number of reasons. I mean, if it's from the, not having to use the energy to actually harvest um, that forage yourself and letting the animals do it themselves or the manure management benefits that come from self deposition and those kind of things. A lot of those components are already really pretty well known and um, have the have some numbers associated with it. I think the heavier lift is certainly taking that and Moving that into a discussion about how do we how do we how do we better incentivize that activity in what is a you know continuously changing dairy landscape of the dairy industry. I know that Kara, obviously, you are you know that's not a foreign concept to you. You've been working on those um, goals for a long time, and and so you're well versed in in um, the ways that our dairy industry has evolved and and moved away from grazing more um, 
more routinely than the other way around. So policies that we can look at to incentivize that move back to more rotational grazing in the landscape, more perennials in those rotations even would be a huge move, that kind of thing is, is really where we're trying to go next. I see there's also the next question from Dana um, about discussions about raise to better support soil health and climate smart ag uh, practices related to ag markets and supply chains. Yes. And I think, you know, a lot of what's going to be coming there is from those carbon markets that I was talking about. The private sector, from what I've been hearing and learning about in these natural working lands um, sessions and also through the Climate Alliances, those, those companies are very much looking to work with their um, supply chains to ensure that from literally the ground up um, that those practices are being um, engaged in across the supply chain. So starting with the where that product is produced is certainly a big part of that. And so it's um, a lot of the things, there's a lot of support from a ton of private sector industry or uh, companies on that growing climate solutions bill, which I think will provide a lot more opportunity to access the financial benefits of um, the climate of the carbon markets to support um, changes on the ground. Okay, well, I think we're going to cut it off here. It's our time to end our um, county conservation meeting. Thank you, Dan and Sarah, very much. Um, interesting statistics and information and ways for us to be involved. Um, so I think we're going to give close out. It seems a little um, non monumental when we're all remotely here, but um, can, um, thank you for your presentation. It was very good. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, greatly appreciate everyone's interest. And um, we will be posting the sessions because sometimes we had these breakouts and you didn't know if you weren't able to attend the entire one or you were listening to another one. So we will get those posted on the Wisconsin Land and Water website. Um, again, we're gonna cut it off there. We will get these questions downloaded. Um, I think Dan's been answering some of them. So thanks again. I'm gonna sign off and have a great weekend, great summer. And um, if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at Wisconsin Land and Water. Um, we're there to help you. I'm the membership services coordinator and training coordinator. So um, I a lot of times don't know the answer, but you can feel free to contact me and I will try to find someone. I've been around for a long time working with these people. So um, yeah, my email is penny at wisconsinlandwater.org. Um, I'm always there to help you. And thanks again, Sarah Dan and everyone. I'm signing off. Thank you. Take care and have a great weekend. Be safe.